All right, so composite functions. <clears throat> I'm going to try to give you an example. I, I hope it is somewhat meaningful to you. You're going to have to draw back to some uh, Algebra 2 knowledge. So this particular function, I, the book had some one about area, and I thought it was kind of cheesy, but uh, maybe it's perfectly fine. Uh, I'm not certainly not saying that the people who write textbooks. I'm, I'm more capable than those that write textbooks. But um, this being a... Uh, an interest function, r over n, n t to the n t. Uh, it should be somewhat familiar. You may not remember everything, but um, this particular function uh, starts out with this idea of, the, of a principal amount and uh, an interest rate in r. Interest rate is r. N is the uh, compounding period. Oftentimes, that's a month uh, for a lot of uh, applications. Compounded, compounding period, sorry. And T is the number of, oops, I think someone, me, I think someone wanted to type, number of years that you're going to make the investment. Um, so if I were to say that we were, we were going to invest this money for 12 years, no, let's not use 12, use 10 years. Uh, my <clears throat> my uh, compounding will in fact be monthly, so that means my n uh, is 12. 12 uh, it's monthly, so that's 12 monthly. So I, uh, a better way to explain it, I don't know why this line's here, um, that uh, the number of compounding periods in this, this uh, range, which is the number of compounding periods in a year, so that would be 12. And let's say that our interest rate is equal to 0.05%. I know for current times that's really, really high. So what happens is my function, if I fix all those numbers, my function becomes A, uh, P, 1 plus the rate 0 0.05. Oh, that was 0.05%. I wish you just say it's 5%, but uh, since I've already done it, let's do this. Pow, 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 pow. It's going to be 0 0.0005. That's 0 0.05%. Um, that's really low. I think it might be low for today, but anyway, uh, I had said it sort of incorrectly. My Incorrect per my intentions. 12 and then uh, 10 years. So if we work all that out, this simplifies to be some number. P times 1 plus, I'm not going to divide that out, 0 0.0005 over 12. And this is going to be 120. Now, Let's say at the same, most of the time when you did this kind of problem, you get, you got like, let's start out with $1,000. You'd put that in and you get the other piece of information, interest rate, et cetera, et cetera. And then you would figure out what the amount of money would be after X number of years, or in this case, T number of years. But I'm fixing all those amounts and saying that we're going to, we're going to change this because how many people just have $1,000 to just dump into the fund and hold it there for, for years? Typically, that's not the case. So I'm writing the equation over again. You get 1 plus 0, 0, 0, 0.005 over 12, uh, 120. Uh, but so in this case, we're going to say that my P is a function of W. And specifically, it's, let's say, monthly. Let's say it's $100 times the number of months. So every month, I'm going to put $100 into my account. So uh, after the first month, that will be one. That will be one hundred. Okay. After the second month, that'll be two hundred. After the third month, it'll be three hundred. But we're gaining interest that whole time period. So what that does is we can take this function because it's changing, and we can put it inside our other function, saying that look, the amount of money that I'll have at the end of the ten years is going to be based on one hundred times the number of months that I put hundred dollars in times 1 plus 0 0.0005, 12 to the 120. Now, this type of function would be considered a composite function. Why? It's a composite of two or more functions. And so my two functions were A as a function of P and P as a function of M. Okay? And in this case, I wrote A and then inserted the P inside of A. 
which we could also write as a of p of m. And how would we read this? a of p of m, which you're used to at this point. Okay? So uh, this part you're used to, p of m. So then when I say a of m, a of p of m, a is a function of p, which is a function of m. a is a function of p, which is a function of m. a of p of m. So a more mathematical example would be something like this. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, let f of x equal 1 over x plus 2 and g of x to equal, one, uh, let's say, 4 over x minus 1. Now, let's take a look at the domain of each of these two functions. The domain of f of x is all real numbers, so all x, such that x is in uh, the real numbers, but x cannot equal negative 2 because that'll create that 0 in the denominator and we'd have an asymptote there. And then uh, for g of x, it would be all the same stuff, but x cannot equal 1. Okay? So now let's examine this situation. Let's say that um, f of g, and in high school they would call this fog, which is annoying as all get out because it's misleading, I think which is a function of, g, of x. So what this means is f is a function of g, which is a function of x. So this kind of tells me that g of x is going to be in place of the x from the f of x. So if I write uh, f of x, I can write 1 over x plus 2. But this isn't quite equivalent because this is x, not g of x. So really, I need to write it this way, 1 of g of x plus 2. And then I can substitute what g of x is in for that, and I get 1 over 4 over x minus 1 plus 2. This being, I should have done it in red, but this being g of x, right? This is g of x inserted in for the x in the f of x. So this is f of, of g of x, okay? Now, this is pretty ugly. And the next question that you're going to be asked or the next task that you're going to be uh, that is going to be requested of you is to find the domain of this function, f of g of x. How do we do that? Well, it can get kind of tricky. I will give you, I think, what is the long way. And so what I would tend to do is the following. I'm going to simplify this function so that we get a cleaner denominator. How would I do that? I would take this function, I'm just copying it, plus 2, and I would multiply this function times uh, the, the value of 1 in the form of x minus 1 over x minus 1. So what is it going to do in the numerator? 1, let me change colors. I already used orange. 1 times x minus 1 is x minus 1, right? And now this is the bottom gets, the denominator gets somewhat complicated. If I take x minus 1 and multiply it times this thing, 4 over x minus 1 plus 2, I have to distribute this x minus 1 to both of these terms, right? So numerator stays the same. And I get x minus 1 times this first term, 4 over x minus 1. And then the second term looks like plus 2 times x minus 1. Okay, so in other words, this times this gives me the blue, and then this times this gives me the green. I've distributed. Now, <clears throat> what is x minus 1 divided by x minus 1? Hopefully you're telling me that it is, in fact, 
and I can't use black, doofus. That equals 1. So I'm left with 4 plus 2 times the quantity x minus 1. I made a mistake. I forgot this part. All under x minus 1. So I'm going to copy this to get a little more room. And then if I distribute the 2, which I should, I'm going to get 4 plus 2x minus 2, which is x minus 1 over 4 minus 2 is 2, so I get 2x plus 2. If I factor out the 2, or I guess more directly do the following, right? Take this and write 2x plus 2 equals 0, subtract 2 from both sides and get 2x equals negative 2, divide both sides by 2, and I get x equals negative 1. So negative 1 is the value that will make this denominator go to 0. You could probably have done that via inspection rather than setting equal to 0. Fine, that's okay. And so x cannot equal negative 1. Up here originally, x, x could not equal 1 and x could not equal negative 2. Well, what happens is when the g of x is inserted inside of our f of x, it, it kind of changes the denominator, as you saw, and so that f of x of g of x cannot equal, oh, that's, I shouldn't write it that way, its domain is all x in the real numbers except x cannot equal negative 1, at least. But here's the trick. Here's the kind of the tricky part which people have issue with or have trouble with. When we started out, we had this thing called g of x, and it was not allowed to have any x values equal to um, 1. Don't worry about the f of x. This is the one that was in the inside, the function that was inserted into the other. So if my x could not be 1 from the start, because I do this function first, that means it was never there to be had. So it could never have been x equals 1, ever. And then in addition to that, once we make the composite function, x cannot be negative 1 as well, because that'll drive this new denominator to 0. So we have two exclusions, even though the composite function looks like it only has one exclusion, we have two. And so f of g of x um, has a domain that is is such that it's all real numbers except x cannot equal 1 and negative 1. That is your complete analysis. And you can find the negative 1 this way by doing all of this work. But I'm going to tell you that there's an easier way. Now that you see what I'm talking about, here's the shortcut way. This is how we go about doing it the shortcut way. Let's go back to our original functions. We have f of x is equal to, it was some rational, right? Uh, to, to, to 1 over x plus 2. 1 over x plus 2. And <clears throat> g of x was equal to 1 over, excuse me, 4 over x minus 1. Okay, so 4 over x minus 1. Now, um, we knew that for g of x, that's what we have to do, the, the function's being inserted. So if we were examining this situation, we would want to find the, the domain of g of x, which is uh, x cannot equal 1, right? And now we want to basically find out the Okay, and <clears throat> and remember that um, oh poop, erase this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to find the domain for f of x, which was x cannot equal negative two, and the domain of g of x when x such that x cannot equal one, right? So if I'm examining f of g, right, then f of x could not equal negative 2. So I want to find out, find out 
when g of x is equal to negative 2. So in other words, when, it, when g of x is equal to negative 2, that's a number that I can't put into f. I can't put negative 2 in there. So if this ends up equaling negative 2, I can't put the g of x inside there. So I, I can't do this. So I have to figure out when is g of x equal to negative 2. So how do I do that? Well, I say g of x is equal to negative 2, which means that has to equal 4 over x minus 1. And then basically solve this equation right here. So I'm going to multiply both sides by x minus 1. So negative 2 times x minus 1 equals 4 times x minus 1, right? Over x. Uh, and so what happens to these two guys? They equal, zero, uh, equal 1, so I'm left with 4. Uh, divide both sides by negative 2. x minus 1 equals negative 2. Add 1 to both sides, and I get x equals negative 1. Note, so x cannot equal negative 1 when I put it into g. Why? Not because of the denominator here. The denominator restriction was it could not be 1. But it's because if I put negative 1 into g, if I put negative 1 into g of x, I'm going to get this negative 2. And guess what? That'll drive this denominator to 0, which is no good. So it cannot start out as x equals negative 1. In addition to that, it cannot start out as x equals 1 because it'll mess up the first function, the g of x. So that means x cannot equal 1 and negative 1. Guess what? That's what we found out right here, doing it what I would say is the long way. So let's do it again, except we're not going to look at f of g. We're going to look at g of f. So I'm going to write them over again just for convenience. Uh, f of x was equal to 1 over x plus 2, or so I believe and 4 over x minus 1 was g of x. Remember, your domain restriction was x cannot equal negative 2, and your domain restriction was x cannot equal 1. That's your original restrictions. So now we looked at f of g before. Now let's look at g of, of f, or g of f of x. What is the domain restriction on that composite function? So when we start out, since the f is going to be on the inside, first of all, x cannot equal negative 2. Perfectly fine. x cannot equal negative 2. We have that one, one idea. Can't happen. But uh, g of x cannot accept a value coming out of f of x that is equal to 1. So we have to find out when f of x is equal to 1. When does that occur? So 1 must... Uh, equal 1 over x plus 2, so we can figure out the x value that causes this to occur. So multiply both sides by x plus 2, and so 1 times x plus 2 is x plus 2, and then we get subtract 2 from both sides, and we get x equals negative 1. So in this particular case, if I put x equals negative 1 into my function f, out comes a 1, and that causes a problem in this function, g of x, and so that's what's going to be a problem. Uh, I think I'll try to draw a picture next. So g of x has the res domain restriction of all real numbers, but not x equals negative 2, or and x also cannot be equal to negative 1. Notice those answers are different from what we found for uh, f of g, right? So they're not going to be the same. It has to do with this. When I have a function, it's mapping from some domain to some range. And so like that is, let's say that that's f of x, okay? And then I have another function that's mapping its domain, which comes from this range, because this guy generates all the numbers first. This goes into this range for that function, and that's my g of x. This image is actually depicting g of f of x because I did the f part first then the g part as created from the output of the f so I do this first then I do that if I wanted to draw a diagram similar to that for f of g of x by the way this one is g o f and this one's f of g if I want to draw a diagram for that one it would look this way function 
function map. So this would be my domain and range for the purple one. And in this case, it's g of x, because we do that one first. And then this one over here is the domain and range, and this is f of x. Okay. I don't know. That's how it works in my head. I hope it under, you, you can make sense of it. And I know this video is long, sorry. Uh, from there, we need to do some work to determine... Um, oh no, we're going to move on to the next topic. So that's it for, th for that, for the most part. There's some other things that I have to double check if you're going to be asked to do, and we can go over it in class if we need to, or lab. Okay? So, good luck. <laughs>